Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Thomas. Today we're back here with Josh Scorcher. Today, it's the last of the month, so kind of early. <laughs> today we got the top ten surprisingly dark moments in gaming. So, yeah, it's definitely one of the, it's those gaming moments that are just like, damn, that escalated quickly. You know, you could be like, oh, happy points, yay! And then all of a sudden, everyone you know is dead. That I don't know if that's gonna be like a metric, but. It's what it comes to mind, okay? Sheesh. Anywho, let's just get going and see these top 10 supposedly dark moments. See which one makes the list and see if we recognize any of them. Be sure to like, subscribe for more, hope you enjoy. Let's go. When you really get down to it, tone is... Oh, by the way, happy Halloween. I almost forgot. <laughs> in fiction. Serious stories can have humorous moments, and lighthearted or otherwise straightforward stories can have dark moments. Mm -hmm. Some of them jarringly so. Relativity oh. is the name of the game when it comes to ranking these. The darker the moment, mm -hmm. the less dark the rest of the game is, the higher it places. In the same vein, these moments can't have a significant impact on the tone of the game. Ideally, the moment should come out of nowhere, then the game presses on like nothing happens. Oh, one final note. These are surprisingly dark moments, not surprisingly dark games. That could easily be its own list. Fair. Thanks for heads up. <laughs> no. Here we go. I'm surprised it wasn't like a darker tone for like this. Here, let me try it. Yeah, that just sounds bad in my <laughs> I was trying to get a like darker tone, at least darker sounding, but okay. Oh, okay, I'm not sure the nuke scene's gonna be there, but if it was see. ever a game that was oh, perfectly hi, able to balance comedy and legitimate stakes, it'd be Borderlands 2. Oh. On the one hand, you're the last hope against a megalomaniacal businessman trying to wipe out Welcome a planet the Pandora, with the people. Kiddos. On the other hand, everyone's a wisecracking, egomaniacal whack job. Each whack yeah, it just depends last. how you This is best shown through the main villain, Handsome Jack. Mm -hmm. He'll make you fear for your life so one the minute -sequel? and make you laugh out loud the next. I'm rocking my brain trying to think of a name for that diamond pony I bought. I, I was going to call it Piss for Brains in honor of you, but that just feels immature. Hey, uh -huh. hey Butt Stallion? Nah, that's even worse. I'll tell you what, I'll give it some more thought. That all <laughs> changes when you get to Control Core Angel. Here, you're hit with two massive plot twists in a row. Angel is A, a siren, and B, Jack's daughter. Yep, this yep. whole time, he's been using her for personal gain. No wonder he was always talking to her like a little kid. Keep in mind, this happened before the events of the first game. In order to stop the vault key from being charged, Angel asks you to cut off her iridium ejectors, which could kill her in the process. After that ordeal, you're hit with two emotional gut punches. Jack kills Roland, the leader of the resistance, and kidnaps Lilith. For the rest of the game, his personality yeah. doesn't he come killed two of our heroes in the first game. He goes from jovially taunting to threatening your mere existence. Well, I mean, we did just kill his daughter. You and your Not surprised. have corrupted Pandora with your greed and your hatred. It comes down to me to save this world from your kind. But I'm more than happy to do it. And that's the reason I can't put it any higher. Control Core Angel heralds too much of a tone shift in the game. The only reason it still qualifies for the list is that there are still interesting moments to be found through the character dialogue and side missions. True. Side missions, remember? Listen. I'll activate the beacon so I can leave! Leave this place for good! It's been juggled Ooh, and debated about what the right way to play Undertale is. Do you go pacifist, genocide, or neutral? For the record, I want to say I'll uh, write that the right path is whatever you want it to be. It's all valid. Unless your agenda includes killing Perfect Sunshine Boy, then you need to click off this video and rethink your life choices ASAP! However, over time, yeah, it more basically, or less looked do like not kill the Sans. true pacifist route was the actual way to go story-wise. Mm -hmm. It lays out most of the lore, it has a happy ending for everyone involved. Overall, it's pretty light and idealistic. Except for one very noticeable, oh, the secret lab. level in this seemingly cheery route. The True Lab. 
This eerie, yeah. ominous chamber see, is a hidden dark underground secret. addition to Alphys's lab. It can it's only be accessed experiments. in the true pacifist route. So, you manage to find the elevator and made your way down to the spooky lab. And, you know what? At this point, I'm ready for anything. Nothing could possibly be scarier than Photoshop Flowey. Come on, cryptid spooky lab. Three, Here with your two, best. one. There we go. Wait, I lied! I was not, I was not ready for it. No, 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 so much no. And just like that, yep, God is the more. warmth of Goat Mama. God is the joy of Sunshine Boy and Fish Sundere. God is the <laughs> mild annoyance of Santa's puns. All you feel now is utter dread when you discover the darkest secret of the underground, the amalgamates. These twisted, mutilated beasts were once regular monsters who fell yeah. over time. Turns out that Alphys was experimenting on them with human determination, trying to bring yeah. them back from the dead and help them escape the underground. Noble effort, bad execution. Yeah. They weren't compatible and instead mutated into these fusion abominations. Oh, and the cherry on top? Mm -hmm. We find out that Flowey was born in this lab. Everything we endure from this demonic weed in this route and any other was born from this lab. All because Alphys tried to play God. Now, everything about this was, is wait, terrifying. The, the environment, thing? the actual least, body horror, the sorry, lore, I'm trying to remember. delightfully <sighs> morbid. But it's kind of undermined by the existence of the genocide route. Yeah. Going psycho killer, unable to escape the guild after resetting, is abundantly dark. It makes us surprised that the true lab kind of moot when you go the murder route first. But, mm -hmm. you know, when I think about it, who actively does the genocide route first? Either no way, how you choose to Undertale is up to you. But just be warned, there's darkness hidden in light, paved by good intentions. Oh, fantastic. Sort of saves people, but ended up killing six kids. Ever notice that the oh, people Star behind Alex. Kirby seem really fond of Fire Emblem? I mean, Sakura's yeah. obsession mm -hmm. with putting Fire Emblem in Smash is a no-brainer, but even without him, Hal does seem to hmm. like sneaking in a few inspirations into Kirby here and there. Okay. I mean, we have a romantically involved monarch who got brainwashed Sectional? by a force of darkness into conquering other lands, Sectonia? a father who was driven to madness from pursuing the means hmm. to save his lost child, and a cultist who worships a dark god to get revenge on the world for oppressing his people and forcing him into a life of paranoia. But uh -huh. hey, it's Kirby. They're obviously not going to go that dark. Highness got spared from his sad fate, so surely the others are fine, right? Yeah, about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. boy. If you thought Fire Emblem we villains basically had a rough, killed what happened with Sectonia and Haltman? Sure, when we first meet yep. them, they seem like your typical megalomaniacs with flashy boss fights. And yes, they, they are. are that. But once we find out what they've been through, the finale's got tragedy of errors written all over it. Sectonia lost herself to the madness caused by the dark mirror gifted to her by Taranza, who didn't even realize what he did. When Sectonia is pushed Oops. to the edge to kill Kirby, she's fully consumed by the corruption and has to be put down. It's even worse than the true arena since Sectonia did realize what happened to her and is suffering because of it. The whole fight, she was crying for Kirby to kill her, since it's all she can do after being reduced to a husk of sheer destruction. Regardless of what happens, she dies a tragic death, and as far as we know, Taranza is still coping with the loss of his lover. Then there's Hulk, Sorry, who was influenced by Stardream into becoming a corporate madman to the point where he forgot about the daughter he was trying to save. Mm -hmm. And by the time he remembered, it was already too late, too late since Stardream had too already absorbed memories. him into its core. When Kirby's out to beat it, it uses Haltman's soul as a shield for Kirby to blast open until he's completely erased, letting out his last few screams of agony. Could you imagine how fucked up Susie must have been over this? She came back to meet her dad after being trapped in limbo for goodness knows how long, and not only did he neglect her, but they never got a chance to Shit. really make amends with each other. It's no wonder she didn't even wake goodbye to Kirby at the end of Robobot. Kirby is no That's stranger true. to dark elements and ghoulish imagery, but most of the time, every game ends all well and good. The pure mm -hmm. evil monsters always die, and the redeemable antagonists become friends and get to live another day. Not these two, however. They deserve Yeesh. better, but they'll never have it. 
Oh, <laughs> hey, hey who this bowl of onions here? The only thing that puts them this <laughs> low is... Well, at this point, we begin to expect the dark moment in a Kirby story. Like, oh, okay, this game is cute. How fun. And... All right, where's the Eldritch Monster? I know you're out there. This is a Kirby <laughs> game. I know what this is. Kirby yep. and would get along real fine with the Pokedex. I think we can all agree on that part. <laughs> Jeez. I gotta say, like, some of this stuff I'm just surprised by. Yikes. But then again, yeah, when I did the Kirby games, I was like, okay, where's the horror? There's the horror! Okay, where's the way to get him back? There's our way to get him back. <laughs> I swear, you kind of expect this in the games. Like, you kind of do it now with Star Allies and Forgot the Dreamland. Forgotten. Forgotten Land. You know what I mean, right? But back then, they were just pretty much pff, dead. You, I mean, with Maglor, he got lucky. He would have been dead if, you know, Star Allies didn't allow for a retcon of Return the Dreamland that allowed him to come back. You know? Think about it. He could have been just dead, for all we know. <sighs> anyway, moving along. Here goes number seven. Metopia, an huh. RPG adventure where every single character can be anyone you want. Heroes, villains, NPCs, you name it. The possibilities for goofy role-playing are endless. <laughs> or you just download other people's memes because you're not creative enough. I don't know. It's yeah, such a silly yeah, premise. You me. don't think the game will <laughs> ever real. take itself seriously at all. The main villain, the Dark Lord, is just your stereotypical goofy villain who messes with people by taking their faces and slapping them onto a bunch of monsters. It's later revealed that the Dark yeah, Lord is just some guy being possessed by a dark curse, which would then possess the great stage to become the Darker Lord. <laughs> what a name! Yes, I guess that God makes me a whiter mage. <laughs> and after you defeat the Darker Lord, you free the Great Sage and reduce the Dark Curse to a helpless little wisp. Then you learn about how the Dark Curse came to be. Once yep, upon a pass. time, Listen. the Dark Curse was just a, a guy. normal person. Their life was boring and everyone around them thought they were boring. And so they spent their whole life alone. They yeah, played just along wanted their attention. appearance, thinking their plain looks were what made them uninteresting. So they removed their face, which in return, removed themselves from other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Since then, they harbor nothing more than hate and malice, passing away and becoming a curse that lives on to spite people by doing to others what they did to themselves, mm -hmm. removing their faces. Afterwards, you're given a choice to either put the dark curse out of its misery or give it another chance to live a new life with a new face. It really does put into perspective. Mm. Is it better to just let the curse rest in peace, but never see the chance to have a fulfilling life? Or is it better to let it live again, knowing it could still be a spiteful threat, or letting it live with all its guilt? But the most gripping I'm question of all, of giving it a why second am chance. I asking all of this in a game where you can ship Pepsi Man and Kool-Aid Man with each other? Oh, yeah, yeah. All joking aside, this is a so surprisingly poignant backstory for an otherwise silly villain. Mm -hmm. Despite how grim it is, it does fit thematically well with the rest of the game, being about the value of faces and identity. After all, a big part of Miitopia's sure. fun is the many faces you can slap on these different characters and giggle over the silly things that happen to them. In the end, True. the Dark Curse just wanted to be a part of the fun. Really? We're gonna figure out those codes again, because frankly, it's a bit oh. tricky to measure how dark the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games are. Most of them mm -hmm. do tend to start off fairly bright and cheery, only to smack you in the face with some gloomy twists and turns. From the entire world freezing okay. in time to a major character freaking dying, there's no shortage of dark Shit. moments that became a staple with these games. So, how about we look at the one from the first, as well as the most lighthearted title of them all, Rescue Team. The plot okay. is fairly digestible. You become a Pokemon and make friends with other Pokemon you meet. You travel through dungeons, rescue Wait, people, wasn't this and get the one paper. where it was like an someone was going to prophesize the end of the world, right? Going on, but what we did get is interesting enough that it leads us to a pretty heavy twist. As the game progresses, oh, we learn more about the disasters that endangered the lives of many Pokemon. Hmm. It's later revealed that this all happened because a human disturbed Ninetales by grabbing her tail, leading to a curse oh. that turned them into a Pokemon 
followed up by various disasters. Gengar then steps in and starts pointing fingers at our main character as they appear to share similar origins. This made everyone in town, including other rescue teams, turn against the protagonist, believing that if they were destroyed, the curse would end. And so the protagonist and their partner had no choice but to run away and never return. From this point on, you're forced to go through a fugitive arc. No stores to buy items from, no dojo to train in, and no recruits to bring along with you. Nope. It's the first time you feel truly defenseless in these games. All you have with you is your partner, the who one still that trusts believes you. in your innocence and will go through thick and thin to stick up for you. Throughout all this, you cling to the hope that by finding Nine Tails, you can disprove the allegations and return to society once again. For a relatively simple game, it does a great job of weighing in the emotions when it matters. You don't just have the plot turn against you, you have entire gameplay game. mechanics taken away and forced to break through several dungeons without them. Yeah. So when small it's basically numbers a of hope come in like Absol joining your party, it's all the more gratifying that you're making this much progress. And when everything comes together as Ninetales proves our innocence, the euphoria is unbelievable. Is your refrigerator running? <laughs> <laughs> then you better go catch it! Sure, you can yeah, say it turns out mystery dungeon games have much darker and Gengar more was the one that than this. And the, yes, yes, the worst. but those games are much more tonally consistent that the moments aren't nearly as jarring. The contrast between Rescue Team's overall tone and the Fugitive arc stands out so much more compared to the others. And to this day, it remains one of the highlights of a story in any Pokemon game. So much so that Legends Arceus copied its homework just a couple of years after its remake came out. Yeah, I love Legends Arceus and all, but good gravy, that climax sucks. Thank goodness for the post game. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't even know about that. So when you think Ace drunk. Attorney, oh. you think crazy witnesses, oh, crazy on guard, right? and murder mysteries that have more twists than a pretzel stand. Yeah, you play as a lawyer trying to solve murder mysteries, but when some of the witnesses you bring are a rapping pirate, a teacher who won't stop throwing chalk at you, and an actual orca, seriousness really just goes out the window. Despite that, we've had some dark moments in the series, <laughs> but despite how dark some of these scenes got, none of them were able to push the series to get an M rating. Well, Wait. Hmm? At least until Dual Destinies. Destinies. <laughs> really? I talked about Wait, Athena a few times, and she's one of my favorite female characters, or, and where one are we of going? the most underrated characters in the series. Wait, she's just them. a bright ray of really? sunshine, always keeping a smile, and has some fun antics with her in-trial gimmick and her very animated emotional states. But as with any ball of light, the more it shines, the larger yeah. the shadow it casts. When Athena was a child, her mother Metis was a psychologist working mm -hmm. to give robots the ability to read and display emotion like humans. One day, Metis' student Simon Blackwell visited her to get an analysis of a voice recording from an international spy he was chasing called the Phantom. Phantom. While she did the analysis, mm -hmm. it made her a target. The Phantom's mission was twofold, sabotage a rocket launch and kill Metis to take the data. Athena walked in at this point and saw her mother on the floor and the culprit with a bloody katana. Using a nearby knife, she attacked her killer, eventually stabbing his hand. The phantom escaped at this time, but that left Athena dazed and confused. She asked one of the robots to bring her mother to the robot disassembly table. Blackwell enters at this point and... Well... Yeah, something's wrong with mom. I'm taking her apart to fix her. Well, crap. Yeah. For context, Athena was pretty innocent and sheltered. And in her day state, True. she didn't realize the difference between humans and robots. Yep. Blackwell assumed Athena killed her mother, so he sliced up the robot and led Athena out of there. He took the blame for the murder yeah. despite Athena's pleas that he was innocent. Athena blocked out her mother's killer for many years, With only seeing flashbacks of her standing in a sea black of It wasn't until Phoenix figured out the truth that she was able to free herself from her past and find her mother's real killer. While there are other dark moments in Ace Attorney, this one just hits different. 
The no flashbacks kidding. of blood oh. she has. The innocent face she makes when saying something so insane. And the repressed emotions representing her deep despair. No wonder this is the only game to get an M rating. Now, are we getting another Ace Attorney anytime soon? Well, I mean, we've got Please. the remix. Anyway, number four. I'll talk about the Fiendland later. Kind of in a personal mood, you know? I mean, Tears of the Kingdom came out, and it's, uh... Dark, which I love. And here we go. How much are you willing to sacrifice in the name of protecting something you care about? The answer will, of course, vary from person to person. Many people consider the laying down of one's own life to be the highest form of sacrifice. But there are things far, far worse than mere death. In the opening act the of villain. Legend of Zelda Save Tears of the Kingdom, people. Zelda and Link find the mummified Ganondorf who awakens from his deathless slumber and blasts the pair with an overwhelming amount of blight. Link loses his arm and the Master Sword is destroyed, and Zelda gets sent to the distant past. In order to repair the Master Sword, Link sends it back in time to Zelda, and repair it she does, but at a terrible time terrible cost. Yeah, you see, the Master Sword grows stronger as it is bathed in sacred power and can even repair itself by doing so. So, how does Zelda bathe the Master Sword in sacred power? Does, does she... she take it to a holy site and bury it there for Link to dig up in the future? Does she perform some kind of ritual? Does she pray for the goddess's blessing? Nope. No. No, she does not. One Watch. little nugget of foreshadowing, literally, are the secret stones, artifacts which amplify a person's innate power. Unfortunately, even with that, it isn't enough to defeat Ganondorf or fix the Master Sword. Zelda needs to get stronger. There is one way, though. If someone swallows the secret stone, they transform into an immortal dragon, and their powers are amplified a thousandfold. However, there is a cost. They lose their minds and become little more than senseless beasts. Zelda decides that horrifying fate is worth the cost of saving the world. Here we go. As if losing one's cognition and sanity weren't horrifying enough, yeah. well, the Look transformation secret sure takes care of that. Also, if the split the timeline eyes. theory is true, yeah. and this goes all the way back to the founding of Hyrule, like the yeah. founding founding like, of Hyrule, then there's wow. a small chance that in some of the branches, there exists light dragon Zeldas that are stuck like that. So can I start therapy now or should I wait for the nightmares to set in? In a series that has plenty Yikes. of surprisingly dark moments, believe me when I say Zelda's transformation into the Dragon of Light takes the cake. The only reason this entry isn't number one is because Zelda does because regain we her, get her humanity back. in the end. To the relief of many and the disappointment of some, I'm sure. <laughs> and you're supposed to be dead. I got better? I mean, fair, but Jesus. Honestly, I think the Dragon thing could be really dope. Like, if she could, like... Okay, sorry. I'm just, like, thinking about it, but... You know how she was cured, but... What if it's just, like, a small piece of that thing still there? Like, she could, like, transform part of herself into dragons? Like, it's still possible. I mean, hey, it would allow her to get into the action a lot more often, I guess. Since, you know, dragon skills are pretty tough. Can you imagine that, though? Jeez. Well, I'm just saying, there's dragon... People, you know, humanoid dragons. Why not? <laughs> can only imagine how that would look in Zelda's universe. You know? Jeez, can you imagine that? Like, somehow Zelda gets back, to, like, be able to control, like, a dragon-type form. And just start a new race in Hyrule. Honestly, I feel like that'd be a, like, a, I don't know. Like, a whole different story that I think that's gonna need a new game for that. I... 
Sorry, I got nothing else to say. Let's keep going. Final three. Final three. Hmm? Guy guess. Ah. The Elder oh, Abomination of Mother. How could I not? Nearly three oh, decades Sorry. after its release, Earthbound is still considered one of the defining cult classics. The simple yet effective combat, witty humor, and lighthearted story are still praised to this day. The story in particular is lauded thanks to all the delightfully absurd situations you find yourself in. At one point, you need to remove a pencil statue by erasing it. And that's huh, one of the less weird things that happens. Yeah, less. While there is some dark stuff, it's more bizarre than actively unnerving mostly anyway that all changes when it's time for the final boss things aren't too bad at first with a relatively straightforward battle against gygus and porky porky then claims that if you were to see gygus's true form you'd be terrified and oh boy does it live up to the hype the music goes from an intense bop to just just disturbing the like background i said gives you nothing, but his distorted face staring at you Porky even goes so far as to taunt you, saying that you might as well just cry out for mommy and daddy. You eventually realize there's simply no way to beat Gygus on your own, and you pray for help. Aw, look at that. Everyone back at Saturn Valley can hear you. Maybe this won't be so... Bad? Much for what that the... idea. For as sweet as it is to see your Sheesh. allies supporting you, it's kind of hard to appreciate that with the whole... Horrific abomination staring you in the face thing. Mm -hmm. All the while, Gygus is wailing in agony. It sure is a good thing this game doesn't have voice. I spoke too soon again. The fight is capped off with a death that makes you feel less like you won and more like the game glitched your victory. It gets even worse if you played the original Mother slash Earthbound Whoa. beginnings. To make a long story short, Gygus was once an alien who was driven to revenge after having his technology stolen by a human. As a result of yep. his insanity and powers going haywire, he turned into well, this. this. And then there's his real life inspiration. Creator Shigesato Itoi based oh, him on a traumatic memory where he accidentally walked into the wrong movie theater as a child and witnessed a murder scene. At the very least, you can take solace in the fact that nothing like Gygus could ever exist IRL. Unlike the next entry. Let's talk about Gygus the better next. Next. Okay, we have reached number two, and I'll admit, this one is pretty heavy. While number one is more surprising, this one is definitely the darkest on this list. And it's from oh. Trails of All Things. Hmm. Okay, you guys are a small but surprisingly profitable demographic. Give me a break. Fair enough. So let's talk about a fan favorite character, <laughs> Ren. When you first meet uh -huh. her, she seems like your okay. innocent, mischievous girl who is separated from her parents. She bonds pretty quickly with your party member, Tita, due to their shared love of technology. But it turns out these parents that she is separated from are a giant robot she considers her guardian, and that she is actually a member of the evil society yeah, Ouroboros that act as the main villains of the game. Throughout the rest of the game, she performs as the antagonist, acting as the personal foil for Tita and Estelle. But you can tell she isn't all there. While she is incredibly intelligent for a girl her age, something Trails will do plenty of in the future, she is extremely axe crazy, going between sweet and innocent and psychopathically creepy and insane at the drop of a hat. Oh yeah, a reminder, she's 12. Don't go with her to a tea party. They involve maiming, explosions, crumpets, and a cutting from her scythe. Despite this, she is about feeling actual love and warmth from not only Tita, but also main characters Estelle and Joshua. This conflict hmm. inside her leads her to run away from the trio as she's struggling over the idea that she can get love from someone else that isn't her robot and the society. In Trails okay. in the Sky the Third, Ren joins huh. as a begrudging party member, and throughout this Grudge. game there are these memory doors that build upon the past of the main characters. Deep in the Abyss, an optional dungeon that only opens in the final chapter Lay Star Door 15. And in this door, 15. we learn why Ren is how she is. And, um, disturbing content warning here. Here we go. Thank you. When Ren was five years old, she was kidnapped by a child experimenting cult and brought to one of their facilities. Uh -oh. This facility, known as Paradise, Paradise, was more than just a lab. It was also a 
child sex ring that was usually frequented by politicians and rich folk of the skeeviest kind. To Basically, it's the pedophiles. Created artificial Great. personalities for herself based on the other children. While it worked to help her cope, it also led to her being requested a lot since she was subconsciously changing these personalities to fit the client. As time went on oh and she boy. got more used to the treatment, she killed off these personalities in her head until she woke up from her self-imposed psychosis. To cope from Jesus here, Christ. she inflicted self-abuse to keep herself sane and not fall into the psychosis again. The experimentation and work caused her to develop an insane intellect, but at the cost of her young psyche. The first half of the door oh, is insanely creepy. They don't even hide the implications of what's going on. Even the first scene when a patron asks, what number would you like? That sets a dark tone. You see Ren talking to her personas. You see the internal suffering they are facing. And you see the realization of what they are. It's... Ugh. We don't get any explicit images until the very end, where younger Joshua and his brother find a tortured Ren among dead bodies and bring her with God. them to Ouroboros on a whim. And from there, the trail series happens. She goes on to think her parents sold her to the cult as a way to fix their business expenses. She sees them with a new child, thinking uh -oh. him to be a replacement for her, that she was nothing but a thing for them to sell. So, yeah, not surprising how she ended up the creepy psychopath we yep. see in Sky 2. The good news from here uh, is that second. Ren surprisingly recovered. She huh? finds out that her parents didn't sell her, but she was kidnapped and they thought she was dead. Oh. She's adopted by Estelle and Joshua's family and lives oh. as their sister. She develops a strong friendship with Tita and considers her as her best friend. And as a Cold Steel 4, she even meets with her family again in a very wholesome scene. Not that she reveals who she is to them. Similar to Fair. Athena, Ren's backstory is just... What the hell? While even Sky the Third has other dark moments like Kevin's backstory, it's not this! this. This was so Jesus. bad that it was censored in later versions of the game, but its really? implications not only set up a major conflict in the next arc, but also the rest of the series. However, mm. if you want a complete tone shift, see number one. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute, but here comes some honorable mentions. Dead Marowak, Pokemon Red and Blue. The world of Pokemon is so bright and cheerful. Until you remember that Pokemon could actually die. Yep. The Nuke, Call of Duty 4. We were so sure we were going to get to save everyone. Sadly, war nope, doesn't too come late. without a tragedy. Battle of Bell Hollow, Fire Emblem Genealogy. This moment got memed so much, people forgot how harrowing it is that the main character dies, dies. mid-game. The Ring of Chaos, Kid Icarus Uprising. Ha ha, funny fourth wall breaking game, genocidal goddess. Ha ha, funny fourth wall breaking game. Give us a sequel, Nintendo. Middle Ages ending, live alive. Oh. This would absolutely have made the list if not for the sheer abject existential horror that is the near future chapter. Mm. Fire Mountain, Forestia. Let's be honest, this is the only reason anybody remembers this game. Genociding the Forest People, Etrian Odyssey. Eesh. I know you were hired to do this, but at the same time, why? John's backstory, No More Heroes. It's a good thing this part was skipped over because Jeez, all oh, that would make this boss really hard to focus on. Mm -hmm. Number one. Most one of my fellow writers has been oh, hey, itching Jasper. to write about these two. Wish granted Sam and Beth. how? Sam and Max, one of Telltale Games' longest lasting series and one of their very first. For all the darker subjects the duo tackled, the mafia, presidential assassinations, mm -hmm. conspiracy nuts, dirty politics, abduction, terminal Tourette syndrome, Scientology spoofs, and arguably the most depressing portrayal of hell, none mm. of it is really taken seriously. Hey, it's Culture? just played for laughs, and our freelance boys just shrug it off or make a mean comment or meme on it while everyone yep. around them are the ones Oh, that the suck. devil's toy box, Nothing right? really gets to them. But come season three, The Devil's Playhouse, and that mixed things up yep. big time. The laughs are Watch. still very much here, but they give the season a more cinematic feel. More dynamic lighting, a tighter, serialized plot, and a more sinister, foreboding atmosphere. They even have a Twilight Zone-style narrator this time around. Sheesh. 
We'll get back to him later. Mm -hmm. Already, we're dealing with some pretty heavy shit, yeah. Doc. Like having Max freaking lobotomized in one episode, throwing Sam into a mental breakdown. I almost wanted to use that one, but then the season finale happened. To set the scene, Max has been turned into an eldritch kaiju, and his head is about to explode after using his new psychic powers too much. Uh, okay, this already looks pretty bleak, but I'm sure they'll think of a half-baked plan to get out of this one. They always do. He's going to make it, right? Uh, they would have really killed Max off, right? Max? Right? There's nothing we can do. I'm sorry, Sam. Damn. That's it? After all those adventures, he just bites it? So... Pretty much. Yeah. Max He's is gone. dead. For real this time. Well, he for out, a bit, but you know what's ending. himself to save all of New York City... And to add salt to the wound, they can't bring him back. Yeah. Gone. Reduced to atoms. I mean, he's quote unquote died before in the franchise, and it's mostly been played for laughs, but here, it's yeah. completely straight. Just yeah, look at how miserable Sam is during the end credits, wandering aimlessly through New York without his little buddy. It's just, where did this come from? This is surprisingly grim for an otherwise zany video game series. But remember that Twilight Zone narrator I mentioned earlier? Spoiler alert, he's actually Max's super ego and the overarching villain of the season. Oh. And he orchestrated this whole thing to have Max killed and the city destroyed Damn. because he didn't like Max's chaotic personality. But wait, he's part of Max's brain, so... How is he alive? Wait a minute. Did Max secretly want to end himself? I know that sounds like a stretch, but this revelation about Max's super ego opens a whole lot of implications. Like how huh. underneath this trigger happy, wisecracking, fuzzy white rabbity thing, there's a sad clown who can't stand to look at his own face. Sheesh. In the end, however, they pull a bit of a switcheroo where another Max from an alternate timeline ends up taking the real Max's place. It may seem like yeah. a cop-out, but so what? Can you honestly say you'd want to see the freelance police split up like this? Still, major credit where credit is due. The fact that they had the cojones to pull off this kind of tragedy in a normally lighthearted series and do it this well is kind of brilliant. Which is good, because Dark Stories kind of became Telltale's forte afterwards, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. I'm the Fiery Joker, and a wise man once said, In Rest darkness there is always light, and sometimes you need a guiding hand to help you towards that light. I don't know who said that, but they're probably going to be on the next list. Huh. I wonder if he's skipping tomorrow, because I know he's usually doing, like, the first and the 15th. So, maybe he got this one early, because, you know, Halloween. <laughs> well, there you go. Max's death in the Devil's Playhouse, which... God damn. Like, I played, like, two of the Sam Max games. Sheesh. You did not see that coming. God, I mean, at least Sam has a Max, but Max we know is gone. It sucks, but, well, I guess I got nothing else to say. I'm going to stop before we get too depressed, so thanks for watching, guys. See ya.